six. At the place where the ramp merged with the turnpike, the two men, the boy, and the bumbler clustered around Susanna in her new wheelchair. All of them looked east. Eddie didn't know what the traffic situation would be like once they cleared Topeka, but here all the lanes, those headed west as well as the eastbound ones on their side, were crammed with cars and trucks. Most of the vehicles were piled high with possessions gone rusty with a season's worth of rain. But the traffic was the least of their concerns as they stood there looking silently eastward. For half a mile or so, on either side of them, the city continued. They could see church steeples, a strip of fast food places, Arby's, Wendy's, McDee's, Pizza Hut, and one Eddie had never heard of called Boing Boing Burgers, car dealerships, the roof of a bowling alley called Heartland Lanes. They could see another turnpike exit ahead, the sign by the ramp reading Topeka State Hospital and Southwest 6th. Beyond the off-ramp there hulked a massive old red brick edifice with tiny windows peering like desperate eyes out of the climbing ivy. Eddie figured a place that looked so much like Attica had to be a hospital, probably the kind of welfare purgatory where poor folks sat in shitty plastic chairs for hours on end, also some doctor could look at them like they were dog shit. Beyond the hospital, the city abruptly ended and the thinny began. To Eddie it looked like flat water standing in a vast marshland. It crowded up to the raised barrel of I-70 on both sides, silvery and shimmering, making the signs and guardrails and stalled cars waver like mirages. It gave off that liquidy humming sound like a stench. Susanna put her hands to her ears, her mouth drawn down. I don't know as I can stand it. Really, I don't mean to be spleeny, but already I feel like vomiting, and I haven't had anything to eat all day. Eddie felt the same way. Yet, sick as he felt, he could hardly take his eyes away from the thinny. It was as if unreality had been given... What? A face? No. The vast and humming silver shimmer ahead of them had no face was the very antithesis of a face, in fact, but it had a body, an aspect, a presence. Yes, that last was best. It had a presence, as the demon which had come to the circle of stones while they were trying to draw Jake had had a presence. Roland, meanwhile, was rummaging in the depths of his purse. He appeared to dig all the way to the bottom before finding what he wanted, a fistful of bullets. He plucked Susanna's right hand off the arm of her chair and put two of the bullets in her palm. Then he took two more and poked them, slug ends first, into his ears. Susanna looked first amazed, then amused, then doubtful. In the end she followed his example. Almost at once an expression of blissful relief filled her face. Eddie unshouldered the pack he wore and pulled out the half-full box of forty-fours that went with Jake's Ruger. The gunslinger shook his head and held out his hand. There were still four bullets in it, two for Eddie and two for Jake. "'What's wrong with these?' Eddie shook a couple of shells from the box that had come from behind the hanging files in Elmer Chambers's desk drawer. "'They're from your world, and they won't block out the sound. Don't ask me how I know that. I just do.' Try them if you want, but they won't work. Eddie pointed at the bullets Roland was offering. Those are from our world, too. The gun shop on 7th and 49th. Clements, wasn't that the name? These didn't come from there. These are mine, Eddie. Reloaded often, but originally brought from the Greenland. From Gilead. You mean the wets? Eddie asked incredulously. The last that are wet shells from the beach, the ones that really got soaked? Roland nodded. You said those would never fire again, no matter how dry they got, that the powder had been, what did you say, flattened? Roland nodded again. So why'd you save them? Why bring a bunch of useless bullets all this way? What did I teach you to say after a kill, Eddie, in order to focus your mind? Father, guide my hands and heart so that no part of the animal will be wasted. Roland nodded a third time. 
Jake took two shells and put them in his ears. Eddie took the last two, but first he tried the ones he'd shaken from the box. They muffled the sound of the thinny, but it was still there, vibrating in the center of his forehead, making his eyes water the way they did when he had a cold, making the bridge of his nose feel like it was going to explode. He picked them out and put the bigger slugs, the one from Roland's ancient revolvers, in their place. Putting bullets in my ears, he thought Ma would shit. But that didn't matter. The sound of the thinny was gone, or at least down to a distant drone, and that was what did. When he turned and spoke to Roland, he expected his own voice to sound muffled, the way it did when you were wearing earplugs, but he found he could hear himself pretty well. Is there anything you don't know? he asked Roland. Yes, Roland said, quite a lot. What about oi? Jake asked. Oi will be fine, I think, Roland said. Come on, let's make some miles before dark. 7. Oi didn't seem bothered by the warble of the thinny, but he stuck close to Jake Chambers all that afternoon, looking mistrustfully at the stalled cars which clogged the eastbound lanes of I-70. And yet, Susanna saw, those cars did not clog the highway completely. The congestion eased as the travelers left downtown behind them, but even where the traffic had been heavy, some of the dead vehicles had been pulled to one side or the other. A number had been pushed right off the highway and onto the median strip, which was a concrete divider in the metro area and grass outside of town. "'Somebody's been at work with a wrecker. That's my guess,' Susanna thought. The idea made her happy. No one would have bothered clearing a path down the center of the highway while the plague was still raging, and if someone had done it after, if someone had been around to do it after, that meant the plague hadn't gotten everyone. Those crammed-together obituaries weren't the whole story. There were corpses in some of the cars, but they, like the ones at the foot of the station steps, were dry, not runny, mummies wearing seat belts for the most part. The majority of the cars were empty. A lot of the drivers and passengers caught in the traffic jams had probably tried to walk out of the plague zone, she supposed. But she guessed that wasn't the only reason they had taken to their feet. Susanna knew that she herself would have to be chained to the steering wheel to keep her inside a car once she felt the symptoms of some fatal disease setting in. If she was going to die, she would want to do it in God's open air. A hill would be best, some place with a little elevation. But even a wheat field would do, came it to that. Anything but coughing your last while smelling the air freshener dangling from the rearview mirror. At one time, Susanna guessed they would have been able to see many of the corpses of the fleeing dead. But not now, because of the thinny. They approached it steadily, and she knew exactly when they entered it. A kind of tingling shudder ran through her body, making her draw her shortened legs up, and the wheelchair stopped for a moment. When she turned around, she saw Roland, Eddie, and Jake holding their stomachs and grimacing. They looked as if they had all been stricken with the bellyache at the same time. Then Eddie and Roland straightened up, Jake bent to stroke Oi, who had been staring at him anxiously. "'You boys all right?' Susanna asked. The question came out in the half-querulous, half-humorous voice of Detta Walker. Using that voice was nothing she planned. Sometimes it just came out. "'Yeah,' Jake said. "'Feels like I got a bubble in my throat, though.' He was staring uneasily at the thinny. Its silvery blankness was all around them now, as if the whole world had turned into a flat Norfolk fen at dawn. Nearby, trees poked out of its silver surface, casting distorted reflections that never stayed quite still or quite in focus. A little farther away, Susanna could see a grain storage tower, seeming to float. The words Gaddish Feeds were written on the side in pink letters, which might have been red under normal conditions. "'Feels to me like I got a bubble in my mind,' Eddie said. "'Man, look at that shit shimmer!' "'Can you still hear it?' Susanna asked. "'Yeah, but faint. I can live with it. Can you?' "'Uh-huh. Let's go.' 
It was like riding in an open cockpit plane through broken clouds, Susanna decided. They'd go for what felt like miles through that humming brightness that was not quite fog and not quite water, sometimes seeing shapes, a barn, a tractor, a Stucky's billboard loom out of it, then losing everything but the road, which ran consistently above the thinny's bright but somehow indistinct surface. Then, all at once, they would run into the clear. The humming would fall away to a faint drone. You could even unplug your ears and not be too bothered, at least until you got near the other side of the break. Once again, there were vistas. Well, no, that was too grand. Kansas didn't exactly have vistas. But there were open fields and the occasional copse of autumn bright trees marking a spring or cow pond. No Grand Canyon or surf crashing on Portland headlight, but at least you could see a bygone horizon off in the distance and lose some of that unpleasant feeling of entombment. Then back into the goop you went. Jake came closest to describing it, she thought, when he said that being in the thinny was like finally reaching the shining water mirage you could often see far up the highway on hot days. Whatever it was, and however you described it, being inside it was claustrophobic, purgatorial, all the world gone except for the twin barrels of the turnpike and the hulks of the cars, like derelict ships abandoned on a frozen ocean. Please help us get out of this, Susanna prayed to a god in whom she no longer precisely believed. She still believed in something, but since awakening to Roland's world on the beach of the Western Sea, her concept of the invisible world had changed considerably. Please help us find the beam again. Please help us escape this world of silence and death. They ran into the biggest clear space they had yet come to near a road sign which read Big Springs Two Miles. Behind them, in the west, the setting sun shone through a brief rift in the clouds, skipping scarlet splinters across the top of the thinny and lighting the windows and taillights of the stalled cars in tones of fire. On either side of them, empty fields stretched away. Full earth come and gone, Susanna thought, reaping come and gone too. This is what Roland calls closing the year. The thought made her shiver. "'We'll camp here for the night,' Roland said, soon after they had passed the Big Springs exit ramp. Up ahead they could see the thinny encroaching on the highway again, but that was miles farther on. You could see a damn long way in eastern Kansas, Susanna was discovering. "'We can get firewood without going too near the thinny, and the sound won't be too bad. We may even be able to sleep without bullets stuffed into our ears.' Eddie and Jake climbed over the guardrails, descended the bank, and foraged for wood along a dry creek bed, staying together as Roland admonished them to do. When they came back, the clouds had gulped the sun again, and an ashy, uninteresting twilight had begun to creep over the world. The gunslinger stripped twigs for kindling, then laid his fuel around them in his usual fashion, building a kind of wooden chimney in the breakdown lane. As he did it, Eddie strolled across to the median strip and stood there, hands in pockets, looking east. After a few moments, Jake and Oi joined him. Roland produced his flint and steel, scraped fire into the shaft of his chimney, and soon the little campfire was burning. Roland, Eddie called. Suze, come over here, look at this. Susanna started rolling her chair toward Eddie. Then Roland, after a final check of his campfire, took hold of the handles and pushed her. "'Look at what?' Susanna asked. Eddie pointed. At first Susanna saw nothing, although the turnpike was perfectly visible, even beyond the point where the thinny closed in again, perhaps three miles ahead. Then, yes, she might see something, maybe, a kind of shape, at the farthest edge of vision. "'If not for the fading daylight... "'Is it a building?' Jake asked. "'Cripes, it looks like it's built right across the highway.' "'What about it, Roland?' Eddie asked. "'You've got the best eyes in the universe.' 
For a time the gunslinger said nothing, only looked up the median strip with his thumbs hooked in his gun belt. At last he said, We'll see it better when we get closer. Oh, come on, Eddie said. I mean, holy shit, do you know what it is or not? We'll see it better when we get closer, the gunslinger repeated, which was, of course, no answer at all. He moseyed back across the eastbound lanes to check on his campfire, boot heels clicking on the pavement. Susanna looked at Jake and Eddie. She shrugged. They shrugged back. And then Jake burst into bright peals of laughter. Usually, Susanna thought, the kid acted more like an eighteen-year-old boy than a boy of eleven. But that laughter made him sound about nine going on ten. And she didn't mind a bit. She looked down at Oi, who was looking at them earnestly and rolling his shoulders in an effort to shrug. Eight. They ate the leaf-wrapped delicacies Eddie called gunslinger burritos, drawing closer to the fire and feeding it more wood as the dark drew down. Somewhere south a bird cried out. It was just about the loneliest sound he had ever heard in his life, Eddie reckoned. None of them talked much, and it occurred to him that at this time of their day hardly anyone ever did as if the time when the earth swapped day for dark was special, a time that somehow closed them off from the powerful fellowship Roland called Cotet. Jake fed Oi small scraps of dried deer meat from his last burrito. Susanna sat on her bedroll, legs crossed beneath her hide smock, looking dreamily into the fire. Roland lay back on his elbows, looking up at the sky, where the clouds had begun to melt away from the stars. Looking up himself, Eddie saw that Old Star and Old Mother were gone, their places taken by Polaris and the Big Dipper. This might not be his world, Takuro Automobiles, the Kansas City Monarchs, and a food franchise called Boing Boing Burgers all suggested it wasn't, but Eddie thought it was too close for comfort. Maybe, he thought, the world next door. When the bird cried in the distance again, he roused himself and looked at Roland. You had something you were going to tell us, he said. A thrilling tale of your youth, I believe. Susan. That was her name, wasn't it? For a moment longer, the gunslinger continued to look up at the sky. Now it was Roland who must find himself adrift in the constellations, Eddie realized. And then he shifted his gaze to his friends. He looked strangely apologetic, strangely uneasy. Would you think I was cousining, he said, if I asked for one more day to think of these things? Or perhaps it's a night to dream of them that I really want. They are old things, dead things perhaps, but I... He raised his hands in a kind of distracted gesture. Some things don't rest easy even when they're dead. Their bones cry out from the ground. There are ghosts, Jake said. And in his eyes, Eddie saw a shadow of the horror he must have felt inside the house in Dutch Hill. The horror he must have felt when the doorkeeper came out of the wall and reached for him. Sometimes there are ghosts, and sometimes they come back. Yes, Roland said. Sometimes there are, and sometimes they do. Maybe it's better not to brood. Susanna said. Sometimes, especially when you know a thing's going to be hard, it's better just to get on your horse and ride. Roland thought this over carefully, then raised his eyes to look at her. At tomorrow night's fire I will tell you of Susan, he said. This I promise on my father's name. Do we need to hear? Eddie asked abruptly. He was almost astounded to hear this question coming out of his mouth. No one had been more curious about the gunslinger's past than Eddie himself. I mean, if it really hurts, Roland, hurts big time, maybe... 
I'm not sure you need to hear, but I think I need to tell. Our future is the tower, and to go toward it with a whole heart, I must put my past to rest as best I may. There's no way I could tell you all of it. In my world, even the past is in motion, rearranging itself in many vital ways. But this one story may stand for all the rest. Is it a western? Jake asked suddenly. Roland looked at him, puzzled. I don't take your meaning, Jake. Gilead is a barony of the western world, yes, and Magus as well, but... It'll be a western, Eddie said. All Roland's stories are westerns when you get right down to it. He lay back and pulled his blanket over him. Faintly, from both east and west, he could hear the warble of the thinny. He checked in his pocket for the bullets Roland had given him, and nodded with satisfaction when he felt them. He reckoned he could sleep without them tonight, but he would want them again tomorrow. They weren't done turnpiking just yet. Susanna leaned over him, kissed the tip of his nose. Done for the day, sugar? Yep, Eddie said, and laced his hands together behind his head. It's not every day that I hook a ride on the world's fastest train, destroy the world's smartest computer, and then discover that everyone's been scragged by the flu. All before dinner, too. Shit like that makes a man tired. Eddie smiled and closed his eyes. He was still smiling when sleep took him. Nine. In his dream, they were all standing on the corner of 2nd Avenue and 46th Street, looking over the short board fence and into the weedy, vacant lot behind it. They were wearing their mid-world clothes, a motley combination of deerskin and old shirts, mostly held together with spit and shoelaces. But none of the pedestrians hurrying by on 2nd seemed to notice. No one noticed the billy bumbler in Jake's arms or the artillery they were packing either. Because we're ghosts, Eddie thought. We're ghosts, and we don't rest easy. On the fence there were handbills, one for the Sex Pistols, a reunion tour, according to the poster, and Eddie thought that was pretty funny. The Pistols was one group that was never going to get back together. One for a comic, Adam Sandler, that Eddie had never heard of. One for a movie called The Craft, about teenage witches. Beyond that one... Written in letters, the dusky pink of summer roses, was this. See the bear of fearsome size, all the worlds within his eyes. Time grows thin, the past's a riddle, the tower awaits you in the middle. There, Jake said, pointing. The rose, see how it awaits us, there in the middle of the lot. Yes. It's very beautiful, Susanna said. Then she pointed to the sign standing near the rose and facing Second Avenue. Her voice and her eyes were troubled. But what about that? According to the sign, two outfits, Mills Construction and Sombra Real Estate, were going to combine on something called Turtle Bay Condominiums, said condos, to be erected on this very spot. When? Coming soon, was all the sign had to say in that regard. I wouldn't worry about that, Jake said. That sign was here before. It's probably old as the hit. At that moment, the revving sound of an engine tore into the air. From beyond the fence, on the 46th Street side of the lot, chugs of dirty brown exhaust ascended like bad news smoke signals. Suddenly the boards on that side burst open and a huge red bulldozer lunged through. Even the blade was red, although the words slashed across its scoop, All hail the Crimson King, were written in a yellow as bright as panic. Sitting in the peak seat, his rotting face leering at them from above the controls, was the man who had kidnapped Jake from the bridge over the river Send, their old pal Gasher. On the front of his cocked-back hard hat, the words Le Merc Foundry stood out in black. Above them, a single staring eye had been painted. 
Gasher lowered the dozer's blade. It tore across the lot on a diagonal, smashing brick, pulverizing beer and soda bottles to glittering powder, striking sparks from the rocks. Directly in its path, the rose nodded its delicate head. Let's see you ask some of your silly questions now, this unwelcome apparition cried. Ask all your wants, my dear little cows. Why not? Very fond of riddles is your old pal Gasher. Just so you understand that no matter what you ask, I'm going to run that nasty thing over. Mash it flat, ah, so I will. Then back over it I'll go. Root and branch, my dear little cows. Ah, root and branch. Susanna shrieked as the scarlet bulldozer blade bore down on the rose, and Eddie grabbed for the fence. He would vault over it, throw himself on the rose, try to protect it. Except it was too late, and he knew it. He looked back up at the cackling thing in the bulldozer's peak seat and saw that Gasher was gone. Now the man at the controls was Engineer Bob from Charlie the Choo Choo. Stop! Eddie screamed. For Christ's sake, stop! I can't, Eddie. The world has moved on, and I can't stop. I must move on with it. And as the shadow of the dozer fell over the rose, as the blade tore through one of the posts holding up the sign, Eddie saw coming soon had changed to coming now, he realized that the man at the controls wasn't Engineer Bob either. It was Roland. Ten. Eddie sat up in the breakdown lane of the turnpike, gasping breath he could see in the air, and with sweat already chilling on his hot skin. He was sure he had screamed, must have screamed, but Susanna still slept beside him, with only the top of her head poking out of the bedroll they shared, and Jake was snoring softly off to the left, one arm out of his own blankets and curled around Oi. The bumbler was also sleeping. Roland wasn't. Roland sat calmly on the far side of the dead campfire, cleaning his guns by starlight and looking at Eddie. Bad dreams. Not a question. Yeah. A visit from your brother? Eddie shook his head. The tower, then? The field of roses and the tower? Roland's face remained impassive, but Eddie could hear the subtle eagerness which always came into his voice when the subject was the Dark Tower. Eddie had once called the gunslinger a tower junkie, and Roland hadn't denied it. Not this time. What then? Eddie shivered. Called. Yes. Thank your gods there's no rain, at least. Autumn rains an evil to be avoided whenever one may. What was your dream? Still, Eddie hesitated. You'd never betray us, would you, Roland? No man can say that for sure, Eddie. And I have already played the betrayer more than once, to my shame. But I think those days are over. We are one. Cartet. If I betray any one of you, even Jake's furry friend, perhaps, I betray myself. Why do you ask? And you never betray your quest. Renounce the tower? No, Eddie. Not that. Not ever. Tell me your dream. Eddie did, omitting nothing. When he had finished, Roland looked down at his guns, frowning. They seemed to have reassembled themselves while Eddie was talking. So what does it mean that I saw you driving that dozer at the end? That I still don't trust you? That subconsciously is this ology of the psyche, the Kabbalah I have heard you and Susanna speak of? Well, yes, I guess it is. It's shit, Roland said dismissively. Mud pies of the mind. Dreams either mean nothing or everything, and when they mean everything, they almost always come as messages from, well, from other levels of the tower. He gazed at Eddie shrewdly. And not all messages are sent by friends. Something or someone is fucking with my head, is that what you mean? I think it possible. 
but you must watch me all the same. I bear watching, as you well know. I trust you, Eddie said, and the very awkwardness with which he spoke lent his words sincerity. Roland looked touched, almost shaken, and Eddie wondered how he ever could have thought this man an emotionless robot. Roland might be a little short on imagination, but he had feelings all right. One thing about your dream concerns me very much, Eddie. The bulldozer? The machine, yes. The threat to the rose. Jake saw the rose, Roland. It was fine. Roland nodded. In his when, the when of that particular day, the rose was thriving. But that doesn't mean it will continue to do so. If the construction the sign spoke of comes, if the bulldozer comes. There are other worlds than these, Eddie said. Remember? Some things may exist only in one. In one where, in one when. Roland lay down and looked up at the stars. We must protect that rose, he said. We must protect it at all costs. You think it's another door, don't you? One that opens on the dark tower. The gunslinger looked at him from eyes that ran with starshine. I think it may be the tower, he said. And if it's destroyed... His eyes closed. He said no more. Eddie lay awake late. Eleven. The new day dawned clear and bright and cold. In the strong morning sunlight, the thing Eddie had spotted the evening before was more clearly visible, but he still couldn't tell what it was. Another riddle, and he was getting damn sick of them. He stood squinting at it, shading his eyes from the sun, with Susanna on one side of him and Jake on the other. Roland was back by the campfire, packing what he called their gunna, a word which seemed to mean all their worldly goods. He appeared not to be concerned with the thing up ahead, or to know what it was. How far away? Thirty miles? Fifty? The answer seemed to depend on how far you could see in all this flat land, and Eddie didn't know the answer. One thing he felt quite sure of was that Jake had been right on at least two counts. It was some kind of building, and it sprawled all across four lanes of the highway. It must. How else could they see it? It would have been lost in the thinny. Wouldn't it? Maybe it's standing in one of those open patches, what Suze calls the holes in the clouds. Or maybe the thinny ends before we get that far. Or maybe it's a goddamn hallucination. In any case, you might as well put it out of your mind for the time being. Got a little more turnpiking to do. Still, the building held him. It looked like an airy Arabian Nights confection of blue and gold. Except Eddie had an idea that the blue was stolen from the sky and the gold from the newly risen sun. Roland, come here a second. At first he didn't think the gunslinger would, but then Roland cinched a rawhide lace on Susanna's pack, rose, put his hands on the small of his back, stretched, and walked over to them. Gods, one would think no one in this band had the wit to housekeep but me, Roland said. We'll pitch in, Eddie said. We always do, don't we? But look at that thing first. Roland did, but only with a quick glance, as if he did not even want to acknowledge it. It's glass, isn't it? Eddie asked. Roland took another brief look. I want, he said, a phrase which seemed to mean reckon so, partner. We've got lots of glass buildings where I come from, but most of them are office buildings. That thing up ahead looks more like something from Disney World. Do you know what it is? No. Then why don't you want to look at it? Susanna asked. Roland did take another look at the distant blaze of light on glass, but once again it was quick, little more than a peak. Because it's trouble, Roland said, and it's in our road. We'll get there in time. No need to live in trouble until trouble comes. Will we get there today? 
Jake asked. Roland shrugged, his face still closed. There'll be water if God wills it, he said. Christ, you could have made a fortune writing fortune cookies, Eddie said. He hoped for a smile, at least, but got none. Roland simply walked back across the road, dropped to one knee, shouldered his purse and his pack, and waited for the others. When they were ready, the pilgrims resumed their walk east along Interstate 70. The gunslinger led, walking with his head down and his eyes on the toes of his boots. 12. Roland was quiet all day, and as the building ahead of them neared, trouble, and in our road, he had said, Susanna came to realize it wasn't grumpiness they were seeing, or worry about anything which lay any farther ahead of them than tonight. It was the story he'd promised to tell them that Roland was thinking about, and he was a lot more than worried. By the time they stopped for their noon meal, they could clearly see the building ahead, a many-turreted palace which appeared to be made entirely of reflective glass. The thinny lay close around it, but the palace rose serenely above all, its turrets trying for the sky. Madly strange, here in the flat countryside of eastern Kansas, of course it was, but Susanna thought it the most beautiful building she had ever seen in her life, even more beautiful than the Chrysler building, and that was going some. As they drew closer, she found it more and more difficult to look elsewhere, watching the reflections of the puffy clouds sailing across the glass castle's blue sky wanes and walls was like watching some splendid illusion. Yet there was a solidity to it as well an inarguability. Some of that was probably just the shadow it threw. Mirages did not, so far as she knew, create shadows. But not all. It just was. She had no idea what such a fabulosity was doing out here in the land of Stuckies and Hardies, not to mention Boing Boing Burgers. But there it was. She reckoned that time would tell the rest. 13. They made camp in silence, watched Roland build the wooden chimney that would be their fire in silence, then sat before it in silence, watching the sunset turn the huge glass edifice ahead of them into a castle of fire. Its towers and battlements glowed first a fierce red, then orange, then a gold, which cooled rapidly to ochre as old star appeared in the firmament above them. No, she thought in Detta's voice. Ain't that one, girl. Not at all. That's the North Star. Same one you seen back home sitting on your daddy's lap. But it was Old Star she wanted, she discovered. Old Star and Old Mother. She was astounded to find herself homesick for Roland's world, and then wondered why she should be so surprised. It was a world, after all, where no one had called her a nigger bitch, at least not yet, a world where she had found someone to love, and made good friends as well. That last made her feel a little bit like crying, and she hugged Jake to her. He let himself be hugged, smiling, his eyes half-closed. At some distance, unpleasant but bearable, even without bullet earplugs, the thinny warbled its moaning song. When the last traces of yellow began to fade from the castle up the road, Roland left them to sit in the turnpike travel lane and return to his fire. He cooked more leaf-wrapped deer meat and handed the food around. They ate in silence. Roland actually ate almost nothing, Susanna observed. By the time they were finished, they could see the Milky Way scattered across the walls of the castle ahead of them, fierce points of reflection that burned like fire in still water. Eddie was the one who finally broke the silence. You don't have to, he said. You're excused, or absolved, or whatever the hell it is you need to take that look off your face. Roland ignored him. He drank, 
tilting the water skin up on his elbow like some hick drinking moonshine from a jug, head back, eyes on the stars. The last mouthful he spat to the roadside. Life for your crop, Eddie said. He did not smile. Roland said nothing, but his cheek went pale, as if he'd seen a ghost or heard one. Fourteen. The gunslinger turned to Jake, who looked back at him seriously. I went through the trial of manhood at the age of fourteen, the youngest of my cartel, of my class, you would say, and perhaps the youngest ever. I told you some of that, Jake, do you remember? You told all of us some of that, Susanna thought, but kept her mouth shut and warned Eddie with her eyes to do the same. Roland hadn't been himself during that telling. With Jake both dead and alive within his head, the man had been fighting madness. You mean when we were chasing Walter, Jake said, after the way station, but before I... I took my fall. That's right. I remember a little, but that's all. The way you remember the stuff you dream about. Roland nodded. Listen, then. I would tell you more this time, Jake, because you are older. I suppose we all are. Susanna was no less fascinated with the story the second time, how the boy Roland had chanced to discover Martin, his father's advisor, his father's wizard, in his mother's apartment. Only none of it had been by chance, of course. The boy would have passed the door with no more than a glance had Martin not opened it and invited him in. Martin had told Roland that his mother wanted to see him, but one look at her rueful smile and downcast eyes as she sat in her low-back chair told the boy he was the last person in the world Gabrielle de Chaine wanted to see just then. The flush on her cheek and the love bite on the side of her neck told him everything else. Thus had he been goaded by Martin into an early trial of manhood, and by employing a weapon his teacher had not expected, his hawk, David, Roland had defeated Court, taken his stick, and made the enemy of his life in Martin Broadcloak. Beaten badly, face swelling into something that looked like a child's goblin mask, slipping toward a coma, Court had fought back unconsciousness long enough to offer his newest apprentice gunslinger counsel. Stay away from Martin yet a while, Court had said. He told me to let the story of our battle grow into a legend, the gunslinger told Eddie, Susanna, and Jake to wait until my shadow had grown hair on its face and haunted Martin in his dreams. Did you take his advice? Susanna asked. I never got a chance, Roland said. His face cracked in a rueful, painful smile. I meant to think about it, and seriously. But before I even got started on my thinking, things changed. They have a way of doing that, don't they? Eddie said. My goodness, yes. I buried my hawk, the first weapon I ever wielded, and perhaps the finest. Then, and this part I'm sure I didn't tell you before, Jake, I went into the lower town. That summer's heat broke in storms full of thunder and hail, and in a room above one of the brothels where Court had been wont to roister, I lay with a woman for the first time. He poked a stick thoughtfully into the fire, seemed to become aware of the unconscious symbolism in what he was doing, and threw it away with a lopsided grin. It landed, smoldering, near the tire of an abandoned Dodge Aspen, and went out. It was good. The sex was good. Not the great thing I and my friends had thought about and whispered about and wondered about, of course. I think store-bought pussy tends to be overrated by the young sugar, Susanna said. I fell asleep listening to the sots downstairs singing along with the piano and to the sound of hail on the window. I awoke the next morning in, well... 
Let's just say I awoke in a way I never would have expected to awake in such a place. Jake fed fresh fuel to the fire. It flared up, painting highlights on Roland's cheeks, brushing crescents of shadow beneath his brows and below his lower lip. And as he talked, Susanna found she could almost see what had happened on that long-ago morning that must have smelled of wet cobblestones and rain-sweetened summer air. What had happened in a whore's crib above a drinking dive in the lower town of Gilead, barony seat of New Canaan, one small moat of land located in the western regions of Midworld. One boy still aching from his battle of the day before and newly educated in the mysteries of sex. One boy now looking twelve instead of fourteen, his lashes dusting down thick upon his cheeks, the lids shuttering those extraordinary blue eyes. One boy with his hand loosely cupping a whore's breast, his hawk-scarred wrist lying tanned upon the counterpane. One boy in the final instance of his life's last good sleep. One boy who will shortly be in motion, who will be falling as a dislodged pebble falls on a steep and broken slope of scree. A falling pebble that strikes another, and another, and another, those pebbles striking yet more, until the whole slope is in motion and the earth shakes with the sound of the landslide. One boy... One pebble on a slope, loose and ready to slide. A knot exploded in the fire. Somewhere in this dream of Kansas an animal yipped. Susanna watched sparks swirl up past Roland's incredibly ancient face, and saw in that face the sleeping boy of a summer's morn lying in a bawd's bed. And then she saw the door crash open, ending Gilead's last troubled dream. Fifteen. The man who strode in, crossing the room to the bed before Roland could open his eyes, and before the woman beside him had even begun to register the sound, was tall, slim, dressed in faded jeans and a dusty shirt of blue chambray. On his head was a dark gray hat with a snakeskin band. Lying low on his hips were two old leather holsters. Jutting from them were the sandalwood grips of the pistols the boy would some day bear to lands of which this scowling man with the furious blue eyes would never dream. Roland was in motion even before he was able to unseal his eyes, rolling to the left, groping beneath the bed for what was there. He was fast, so fast it was scary, but, and Susanna saw this too, saw it clearly, the man in the faded jeans was faster yet. He grabbed the boy's shoulder and yanked, turning him naked out of bed and onto the floor. The boy sprawled there, reaching again for what was beneath the bed, lightning quick. The man in the jeans stamped down on his fingers before they could grasp. Bastard, the boy gasped. Oh, you bastard! But now his eyes were open. He looked up and saw that the invading bastard was his father. The whore was sitting up now, her eyes puffy, her face slack and petulant. Here, she cried, here, here. You can't just be a-coming in like that, so you can't. Why, if I was to raise my voice... Ignoring her, the man reached beneath the bed and dragged out two gun belts. Near the end of each was a holstered revolver. They were large and amazing in this largely gunless world, but they were not so large as those worn by Roland's father, and the grips were eroded metal plates rather than inlaid wood. When the whore saw the guns on the invader's hips, and the ones in his hands, the ones her young customer of the night before had been wearing, until she had taken him upstairs and divested him of all weapons save for the one with which she was most familiar, the expression of sleepy petulance left her face. What replaced it was the fox-like look of a born survivor. She was up, out of bed, across the floor, and out the door before her bare bum had more than a brief moment to twinkle in the morning sun. Neither the father standing by the bed nor the son lying naked upon the floor at his feet so much as looked at her. 
The man in the jeans held out the gun belts, which Roland had taken from the fuser beneath the apprentice's barracks on the previous afternoon, using Court's key to open the arsenal door. The man shook the belts under Roland's very nose, as one might hold a torn garment beneath the nose of a feckless puppy that is chewed. He shook them so hard that one of the guns tumbled free. Despite his stupefaction, Roland caught it in midair. "'I thought you were in the West?' Roland said, in Crescia, after Farson and his Roland's father slapped him, hard enough to send the boy tumbling across the room and into a corner with blood pouring from one corner of his mouth. Roland's first appalling instinct was to raise the gun he still held. Stephen Deshane looked at him, hands on hips, reading this thought even before it was fully formed. His lips pulled back in a singularly mirthless grin, one that showed all of his teeth and most of his gums. "'Shoot me if you will. Why not? Make this abortion complete. Ah, oh, gods, I'd welcome it!' Roland laid the gun on the floor and pushed it away, using the back of his hand to do it. All at once he wanted his fingers nowhere near the trigger of a gun. They were no longer fully under his control, those fingers. He had discovered that yesterday, right around the time he had broken Court's nose. Father, I was tested yesterday. I took Court's stick. I won. I'm a man. You're a fool, his father said. His grin was gone now. He looked haggard and old. He sat down heavily on the whore's bed, looked at the gun belts he still held, and dropped them between his feet. You're a fourteen-year-old fool, and that's the worst, most desperate kind. He looked up, angry all over again, but Roland didn't mind. Anger was better than that look of weariness, that look of age. I've known since you toddled that you were no genius, but I never believed until yester eve that you were an idiot. To let him drive you like a cow in a chute. Gods! You have forgotten the face of your father. Say it! And that sparked the boy's own anger. Everything he had done the day before, he had done with his father's face firmly fixed in his mind. That's not true! He shouted from where he now sat with his bare butt on the splintery boards of the horror's crib and his back against the wall, the sun shining through the window and touching the fuzz on his fair, unscarred cheek. It is true, you whelp! Foolish whelp! Say your atonement or I'll strip the hide from your very... They were together! He burst out. "'Your wife and your minister, your magician, I saw the mark of his mouth on her neck, on my mother's neck!' He reached for the gun and picked it up, but even in his shame and fury was still careful not to let his fingers stray near the trigger. He held the apprentice's revolver only by the plain, undecorated metal of its barrel. Today I end his treacherous seducer's life with this, and if you aren't man enough to help me, at least you can stand aside and let me one of the revolvers on Stephen's hip was out of its holster and in his hand before Roland's eyes saw any move. There was a single shot, deafening as thunder, in the little room. It was a full minute before Roland was able to hear the babble of questions and commotion from below. The Prentice gun, meanwhile, was long gone, blown out of his hand and leaving nothing behind but a kind of buzzing tingle. It flew out the window, down and gone, its grip a smashed ruin of metal, and its short turn in the gunslinger's long tail at an end. Roland looked at his father, shocked and amazed. Stephen looked back, saying nothing for a long time. But now he wore the face Roland remembered from earliest childhood, calm and sure. The weariness and the look of half-distracted fury had passed away like last night's thunderstorms. At last his father spoke. I was wrong in what I said, and I apologize. You did not forget my face, Roland, but still you were foolish. You allowed yourself to be driven by one far slyer than you will ever be in your life. It's only by the grace of the gods and the working of Ka that you have not been sent west, one more true gunslinger out of Martin's Road, out of John Farson's Road, and out of the road which leads to the creature that rules them. 
He stood and held out his arms. If I had lost you, Roland, I should have died. Roland got to his feet and went naked to his father, who embraced him fiercely. When Stephen Deshane kissed him first on one cheek and then the other, Roland began to weep. Then, in Roland's ear, Stephen Deshane whispered six words. Sixteen. What? Susanna asked. What six words? I have known for two years, Roland said. That was what he whispered. Holy Christ, Eddie said. He told me I couldn't go back to the palace. If I did, I'd be dead by nightfall. He said you have been born to your destiny in spite of all Martin could do, yet he has sworn to kill you before you can grow to be a problem to him. It seems that, winner in the test or no, you must leave Gilead anyway. For only a while, though, and you'll go east instead of west. I'd not send you alone, either, or without a purpose. Then... Almost as an afterthought, he added, or with a pair of sorry Prentice revolvers. What purpose? Jake asked. He had clearly been captivated by the story, his eyes shone nearly as bright as Oi's. And which friends? These things you must now hear, Roland said. And how you judge me will come in time. He fetched a sigh. The deep sigh of a man who contemplates some arduous piece of work, and then tossed fresh wood on the fire. As the flames flared up, driving the shadows back a little way, he began to talk. All that queerly long night he talked, not finishing the story of Susan Delgado until the sun was rising in the east and painting the glass castle yonder with all the bright hues of a fresh day, and a strange green cast of light, which was its own true color. Part Two Susan Chapter One Beneath the Kissing Moon One A perfect disk of silver, the Kissing Moon, as it was called, in full earth, hung above the ragged hill five miles east of Hambry and ten miles south of Eyebolt Canyon. Below the hill, the late summer heat still held, suffocating even two hours after sundown, but atop the coos, it was as if Reap had already come, with its strong breezes and frost-pinched air. For the woman who lived here, with no company but a snake and one old muty cat, it was to be a long night. Never mind, though. Never mind, my dear. Busy hands are happy hands, so they are. She waited until the hoofbeats of her visitors' horses had faded, sitting quietly by the window in the hut's large room. There was only one other, a bedroom little bigger than a closet. Musty the six-legged cat was on her shoulder. Her lap was full of moonlight. Three horses bearing away three men. The big coffin hunters, they called themselves. She snorted. Men were funny. Aye, so they were, and the most amusing thing about them was how little they knew it. Men, with their swaggering, belt-hitching names for themselves. Men so proud of their muscles, their drinking capacities, their eating capacities, so everlastingly proud of their pricks. Yes, even in these times, when a good many of them could shoot nothing but strange, bent seed that produced children fit only to be drowned in the nearest well. Ah, but it was never their fault, was it, dear? No, always it was the woman, her womb, her fault. Men were such cowards, such grinning cowards. 
These three had been no different from the general run. The old one with the limp might bear watching, ay, so he might. A clear and overly curious pair of eyes had looked out at her from his head. But she saw nothing in them she could not deal with, came it to that. Men. She could not understand why so many women feared them. Hadn't the gods made them with the most vulnerable part of their guts hanging right out of their bodies like a misplaced bit of bowel? Kicked them there, and they curled up like snails. Caressed them there, and their brains melted. Anyone who doubted that second bit of wisdom need only look at her night's second bit of business, the one which still lay ahead. Thorin, mayor of Hambry, chief guard of barony, no fool like an old fool. Yet none of these thoughts had any real power over her, or any real malice to them, at least not now. The three men who called themselves the Big Coffin Hunters had brought her a marvel, and she would look at it, aye, fill up her eyes with it so she would. The gimp, Jonas, had insisted she put it away. He had been told she had a place for such things, not that he wanted to see it himself, not any of her secret places, gods forbid. At this sally, de Pape and Reynolds had laughed like trolls, and so she had. But the hoofbeats of their horses had been swallowed by the wind now, and she would do as she liked. The girl whose tits had stolen what little there was of Hart Thorin's mind would not be here for another hour at least. The old woman had insisted that the girl walk from town, citing the purification value of such a moonlit heel and toe, actually just wanting to put a safe bumper of time between her two appointments, and during that hour she would do as she liked. Oh, it's beautiful, I'm sure it is, she whispered. And did she feel a certain heat in that place where her ancient bow legs came together? A certain moisture in the dry creek which hid there? Gods! Ah, even through the box where they hid it, I felt its glam. So beautiful, musty, like you. She took the cat from her shoulder and held it in front of her eyes. The old Tom purred and stretched out its pug of a face toward hers. She kissed its nose. The cat closed its milky gray-green eyes in ecstasy. So beautiful, like you. So you are, so you are. He. <laughs> she put the cat down. It walked slowly toward the hearth, where a late fire lazed, desultorily eating at a single log. Musty's tail split at the tip so it looked like the forked tail of a devil in an old drawing switched back and forth in the room's dim orange air. Its extra legs, dangling from its sides, twitched dreamily. The shadow which trailed across the floor and grew up the wall was a horror, a thing that looked like a cat crossed with a spider. The old woman rose and went into her sleeping closet, where she had taken the thing Jonas had given her. Lose that, and you'll lose your head, he'd said. Never fear me, my good friend, she'd replied, directing a cringing, servile smile back over her shoulder, all the while thinking men, foolish, strutting creatures they were. Now she went to the foot of her bed, knelt, and passed one hand over the earth floor there. Lines appeared in the sour dirt as she did. They formed a square. She pushed her fingers into one of these lines. It gave before her touch. She lifted the hidden panel, hidden in such a way that no one without the touch would ever be able to uncover it, revealing a compartment perhaps a foot square and two feet deep. Within it was an ironwood box. Curled atop the box was a slim green snake. When she touched its back, its head came up. Its mouth yawned in a silent hiss, displaying four pairs of fangs, two on top, two on the bottom. She took the snake up, crooning to it. As she brought its flat face close to her own, its mouth yawned wider, and its hissing became audible. She opened her own mouth. From between her wrinkled gray lips, she poked the yellowish, bad-smelling mat of her tongue. 
two drops of poison, enough to kill an entire dinner party if mixed in the punch, fell on it. She swallowed, feeling her mouth and throat and chest burn, as if with strong liquor. For a moment the room swam out of focus, and she could hear voices murmuring in the stenchy air of the hut, the voices of those she called the Unseen Friends. Her eyes ran sticky water down the trenches time had drawn in her cheeks. Then she blew out a breath, and the room steadied. The voices faded. She kissed Ermit between his lidless eyes. Time of the kissing moon, all right, she thought, and then set him aside. The snake slipped beneath her bed, curled itself in a circle, and watched as she passed her palms over the top of the ironwood box. She could feel the muscles in her upper arms quivering, and that heat in her loins was more pronounced. Years it had been since she had felt the call of her sex, but she felt it now, so she did, and it was not the doing of the kissing moon, or not much. The box was locked, and Jonas had given her no key, but that was nothing to her, who had lived long and studied much and trafficked with creatures that most men, for all their bold talk and strutting ways, would run from as if on fire had they caught even the smallest glimpse of them. She stretched one hand toward the lock, on which was inlaid the shape of an eye, and a motto in the high speech, I see who opens me and then withdrew it. All at once she could smell what her nose no longer noticed under ordinary circumstances. Must and dust and a dirty mattress and the crumbs of food that had been consumed in bed, the mingled stench of ashes and ancient incense, the odor of an old woman with wet eyes and, ordinarily at least, a dry pussy. She would not open this box and look at the wonder it contained in here. She would go outside, where the air was clean and the only smells were sage and mesquite. She would look by the light of the kissing moon. Rhea of Coos Hill pulled the box from its hole with a grunt, rose to her feet with another grunt, this one from her nether regions, tucked the box under her arm, and left the room. Two. The hut was far enough below the brow of the hill to block off the bitterest gusts of the winter wind, which blew almost constantly in these highlands from reaping until the end of wide earth. A path led to the hill's highest vantage. Beneath the full moon it was a ditch of silver. The old woman toiled up it, puffing, her white hair standing out around her head in dirty clumps, her old dug swaying from side to side under her black dress. The cat followed in her shadow, still giving off its rusty purr like a stink. At the top of the hill, the wind lifted her hair away from her ravaged face and brought her the moaning whisper of the thinny, which had eaten its way into the far end of Eyebolt Canyon. It was a sound few cared for, she knew, but she herself loved it. To Rhea of the Coos it sounded like a lullaby. Overhead rode the moon, the shadows on its bright skin sketching the faces of lovers kissing, if you believe the ordinary fools below, that was. The ordinary fools below saw a different face or set of faces in each full moon, but the hag knew there was only one, the face of the demon, the face of death. She herself, however, had never felt more alive. Oh, my beauty, she whispered, and touched the lock with her gnarled fingers. A faint glimmer of red light showed between her bunched knuckles, and there was a click. Breathing hard, like a woman who has run a race, she put the box down and opened it. Rose-colored light, dimmer than that thrown by the kissing moon, but infinitely more beautiful, spilled out. 
It touched the ruined face hanging above the box and for a moment made it the face of a young girl again. Musty sniffed, head stretched forward, ears laid back, old eyes rimmed with that rose light. Rhea was instantly jealous. Get away, foolish. Tis not for the likes of you. She swatted the cat. Musty shied back, hissing like a kettle, and stalked in dudgeon to the hummock which marked the very tip of Coos Hill. There he sat, affecting disdain, and licking one paw as the wind combed ceaselessly through his fur. Within the box was a glass globe. It was filled with that rosy light. It flowed in gentle pulses like the beat of a satisfied heart. Oh, my lovely one, she murmured, lifting it out. She held it up before her, let its pulsing radiance run down her wrinkled face like rain. Oh, you live, so you do. Suddenly the color within the globe darkened toward scarlet. She felt it thrum in her hands like an immensely powerful motor, and again she felt that amazing wetness between her legs, that tidal tug she believed had been left behind long ago. Then the thrumming died, and the light in the globe seemed to furl up like petals. Where it had been there was now a pinkish gloom, and three riders coming out of it. At first she thought it was the men who had brought her the globe, Jonas and the others. But no, these were younger, even younger than de Pape, who was about twenty-five. The one on the left of the trio appeared to have a bird's skull mounted on the pommel of his saddle. Strange, but true. Then that one and the one on the right were gone, darkened away somehow by the power of the glass, leaving only the one in the middle. She took in the jeans and boots he wore, the flat-brimmed hat that hid the upper half of his face, the easy way he sat his horse, and her first alarm thought was, Gunslinger, come east from the inner baronies, aye, perhaps from Gilead itself. But she did not have to see the upper half of the rider's face to know he was little more than a child, and there were no guns on his hips. Yet she didn't think the youth came unarmed. If only she could see a little better. She brought the glass almost to the tip of her nose and whispered, Closer, lovey, closer still. She didn't know what to expect. Nothing at all seemed most likely, but within the dark circle of the glass the figure did come closer, swam closer almost, like a horse and rider under water, and she saw there was a quiver of arrows on his back. Before him, on the pommel of his saddle, was not a skull but a short bow, and to the right side of the saddle, where a gunslinger might have carried a rifle in a scabbard, there was the feather-fluffed shaft of a lance. He was not one of the old people, his face had none of that look, yet she did not think he was of the outer ark, either. But who are ye, Cully? she breathed, and how shall I know ye? You've got your hat pulled down so far I can't see your god-pounding eyes, so you do. By your horse, mayhap, or perhaps by your— Get away, Musty, why do you trouble me so— the cat had come back from its lookout point and was twining back and forth between her swollen old ankles, roaring up at her in a voice even more rusty than its purr. When the old woman kicked out at him, Musty dodged agilely away, then immediately came back and started in again, looking up at her with moonstruck eyes and making those soft yowls. Rhea kicked out at it again, this one just as ineffectual as the first one, then looked into the glass once more. The horse and its interesting young rider were gone. The rose light was gone as well. It was now just a dead glass ball she held, its only light a reflection borrowed from the moon. The wind gusted, pressing her dress against the ruination that was her body. 
Musty, undaunted by the feeble kicks of his mistress, darted forward and began to twine about her ankles again, crying up at her the whole time. There, you see what you've done, you nasty bag of fleas and disease. The light's gone out of it, gone out just when I... Then she heard a sound from the cart track which led up to her hut, and understood why Musty had been acting out. It was singing she heard. It was the girl she heard. The girl was early. Grimacing horribly, she loathed being caught by surprise, and the little miss down there would pay for doing it, she bent and put the glass back in its box. The inside was lined with padded silk, and the ball fit as neatly as the breakfast egg in his lordship's cup. And still from down the hill, the cursed wind was wrong, or she would have heard it sooner, the sound of the girl singing, now closer than ever. Love, oh, love, oh, careless love, can't you see what careless love has done? I'll give you careless love, you virgin bitch, the old woman said. She could smell the sour reek of sweat from under her arms, but that other moisture had dried up again. I'll give you payday for walking in early on old Rhea, so I will. She passed her fingers over the lock on the front of the box, but it wouldn't fasten. She supposed she had been over-eager to have it open, and had broken something inside it when she used the touch. The I and the motto seemed to mock her, I see who opens me. It could be put right and in a jiffy, but right now even a jiffy was more than she had. Pestering can't, she whined, lifting her head briefly toward the approaching voice, almost here now by the gods, and forty-five minutes before her time. Then she closed the lid of the box. It gave her a pang to do it, because the glass was coming to life again, filling with that rosy glow, but there was no time for looking or dreaming now. Later, perhaps, after the object of Thorin's unseemly late-life prickishness had gone. And you must restrain yourself from doing anything too awful to the girl, she cautioned herself. Remember she's here because of him, and at least ain't one of those green girls with a bun in the oven and a boyfriend acting reluctant about the cries of marriage. It's Thorin's doing. This one's what he thinks about after his ugly old crow of a wife is asleep and he takes himself in his hand and commences the evening milking. It's Thorin's doing. He has the old law on his side and he has power. Furthermore, what's in that box is his man's business, and if Jonas found out she looked at it, that she used it, Aye, but no fear of that, and in the meantime possession were nine-tenths of the law, were it not. She hoisted the box under one arm, hoisted her skirts with her free hand, and ran back along the path to the hut. She could still run when she had to, aye, though few there were who'd believe it. Musty ran at her heels, bounding along with his cloven tail held high and his extra legs flopping up and down in the moonlight. <laughs>